Yeah, I think we can start now. Um, welcome to this year's CSA Digital Email Summit and our session for today is ESPs versus Brands Who Delivers. We are very happy that you're also taking part virtually and we hope we can bring you a little bit of our CSA Email Summit feeling to your home. I would like to introduce our two speakers for today. It's Tamara from Dot .digital and Alice from change.org. <laughs> Tamara is Delivery Operations Manager for Email and SMS at .digital, sorry, and has over seven years experience in delivering email. Alice is also Director of Email Delivery at Change.org and has been in the industry for 17 years, years now. The session today deals with the relationship and responsibilities of ESP versus brands. And as we all know, the relationship between each other is very important for the success of both. Um, I don't want to go too in um, to go to deep into details. I just like to give you a brief introduction to our housekeeping rules for today. Please note you're muted during the whole webinar. If you have any questions, please use the chat function. It might be uh, on the right on your control panel, so um, I can hand over all the questions to Tamara and Alice, who will answer them at the end of the session. Um, you will hear me, I think, at the end of the session for today. And now I'm gladly to hand over to Tamara and Alice. Welcome, everybody. I'm Alice. You've, we've met, just met Tamara. Today we're going to be talking about email service providers, brands, MTAs, and who is responsible for delivery and deliverability. And there's have historically been quite a lot of confusion around the terms deliverability and, and delivery. And we hope today to clear that up. So we'll also look at some common myths and assumptions, that will be fun, and we'll explore the symbiosis that needs to happen between the brand, uh, the ESP, the MTA, for email to work successfully. But let's kick off with a poll, why not? So um, see if there's actually anybody there watching this uh, slightly car crash beginning to our presentation. Um, but are you pretty sure that you already know the difference between delivery and deliverability? Maybe you think you do, but you'd be quite happy for us to, to clear that up. Um, or you're just thinking, what on earth are you talking about, Alice? Um, please vote now and let us know what you think. Got some votes coming in. This is good to see. And we've got quite a few experts, I think, but some people who would like us to know the difference. Yep, it looks like this will be uh, at least vaguely useful for some people. So, hey, let's get going. <laughs> Cool. So, kicking things off with the uh, delivery side of things, which is my area of expertise, I manage mail servers um, because I'm fun like that. So, the expectation is that as soon as you click send on an email, it arrives in, uh, at the place it's supposed to arrive to. Um, and uh, I work for an ESP, and our customers, of course, want their mail to be delivered really super quickly. Um, and we can definitely deliver it fast, but Mailbox providers, Outlook, Gmail, Yahoo, etc. They can only accept mail as fast as they can or want to accept it. Um, content and engagement and reputation can all del uh, impact delivery speed, and we'll explore this a little bit further with a slide a bit later. Um, and just because we've received back a 250OK okay for a mail saying that it's been queued on a mail server doesn't necessarily mean that it's now in the recipient's inbox. There are layers of security and filtering, queuing, there's the general infrastructure to get through once you're, once you're delivered to, to your recipient um, mail server before the email actually appears um, in the inbox. And this kind of brings me on to my next slide, which is what is delivery exactly? Um, and delivery is quite simply the transmission, I say quite simply, it gets a little complicated, but it's the transmission of an email from the sending MTA, the sending mail server, or sending mail transfer agent to the recipient uh, MTA. 
Um, and usually the transmitting MTA will be um, ESP, it will be an in-house managed uh, MTA, um, it might be a mail server operated by an integration that you have with something like uh, Shopify or um, something like that. Um, and the receiving MTA is the mail servers that handle for Hotmail, Gmail, Office 365 or G Suite or all of those good things or all of the millions and billions of, of B2B um, operated domains. So we uh, establish, broadly speaking, um, we establish a connection from the sending mail server to the receiving mail server. We relay the data through that. We get a message saying it's been accepted, and then we close down the connection. But actually, the number of connections that we can establish per IP, so the number of simultaneous connections between two different servers, that can vary according to um, what the recipient mail server wants to see, um, how many emails we can stuff through a connection before it needs to be closed down um, is, is another factor. Um, and then we get several different messages when we're, we're during that transaction um, that denote whether or not it's been successful. So there's the 250 OK uh, success message, which is, yep, accept the mail, all good, um, queued it for delivery. Uh, we get a, a deferral type message which is, or a delayed message, which is kind of a try again later type thing. Um, and that could be for all sorts of reasons, um, including sometimes if the mailbox provider is having infrastructure problems or too much load, that kind of thing, we can get deferrals. Um, or if there's, uh, if you're sending too much mail down a connection or if the mail is a little bit suspect um, or if your reputation isn't great, sometimes you'll see more of those. And then we can get a failure. Um, as well, and that could be something as simple as the mailbox that you're trying to send to just doesn't exist, um, or we can see um, things that are more related to um, blocks, block listings, um, really bad reputation, stuff like that. So, to summarize, delivery is email from one mail server to the other mail server, and that's all it is. Thanks, Tam. There's also a similar um, expectation around deliverability, and that is that, of course, as soon as you press send, your email email lands in people's inboxes straight away, and it's really easy, right? Just pretty much exactly the same. But there's many a slip, twixt cup and lip, and as Tam explained, it's quite easy for mail to be rejected by the receiving server. If it isn't, then hopefully you reach the inbox, and that is success, but that is not always the case. Um, and in fact, according to uh, the latest validity benchmark report, around one in six mails still land in the spam folder. So let's talk a little bit about what is deliverability. So deliverability is really the art of reaching the inbox. You, I, I think everybody knows now that mailbox providers have got really pretty good at cutting out pure spam from reaching people's inboxes. So the days of Viagra and penny stocks and all of those things are long over. And really, I think that the definition of spam has changed to be mail that people just don't want. It, 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 might be, it might be a newsletter that I signed up for last year that's no longer relevant to me or it's now boring for me. And now, now I feel that it's spam. So really, these days, I think that engagement is key. Um, it's, it's going, and it's really going to inform if you land in the inbox or not. And of course, if you do land in the inbox, it's really good to know which part of the inbox you're reaching. So you might be in the focus tab or the other tab at Microsoft or one of the Gmail tabs, not necessarily a bad thing, but, but really good to know what's happening with your mail. So I would say that deliverability is understanding what happens to your mail after it passes that server. So... Time for another poll, check that we haven't put you all to sleep in the first five minutes. So do you know what infrastructure you're using at the moment um, to send your emails? Do you, you have something homegrown that you're using? Um, maybe you've got some uh, NTA uh, like uh, uh, software that's running on some tin or in the cloud. Um, do you use an ESP? Um, maybe you use a CRM to deliver your mail. Maybe you're using uh, some variants of all of the above, or maybe you're not using any of these. Um, yeah, let's let's have another poll and um, see see what people are, how people are sending their mail at the moment. Oh, votes coming in. We haven't put them to sleep, Tom. We're doing well. I know, right? Like. 
bumpy start, but we're, we're, but we're getting there. <laughs> pulling it back, pulling it back. Oh, so interesting mix. So quite a few people sending in house. Um, nice. Quite a few people using his need. Interesting. So let's talk about um, another delivery expectation. Now we're now we're knowing what what delivery is. Um, so let's talk about one of the. the uh, biggest challenges in, in the industry, one of the, one of the many challenges in the industry, but a big challenge, which is IP warming. Um, and I see a lot of this of like IP warming, super easy. You just start off and you just double it. So you send a thousand off the first day and two thousand and four thousand, etc. And you just keep doing that for a couple of weeks until you get your get your volume, um, and then you're good to go. Um, and in reality, uh, IP warming is is not a linear process. Um, and while in some cases maybe with a bit of uh, good luck and a super engaged um, database, doubling every day or every couple of days might work well. Um, different mailbox providers have different expectations. Um, and if you start sending too much too quickly, um, it can go really quite badly wrong and it takes longer to kind of repair that damage um, than it does to just do it right to begin with. Um, we're super reliant on the content being sent, how engaging it is, um, and who it's being sent to as well, whether those recipients are, are opening and clicking and indicating to mailbox providers um, that, they, that they really want that mail. That's what we're trying to do when we warm IPs. Um, what spammers do is they pick up a new IP, however they get it through legitimate or illegitimate means, Blast out a load of spam through it. Um, and then as soon as that IP starts getting blocked, they just move on to the next IP address. And we want to not look like spammers, which is why we do the slow, gradual ramp up, the slow, gradual increase in volume, sending to really engage subscribers, give strong indicators to the mailbox providers that you're sending mail at these people really, really want to receive. Um, and we do that over a period of time. And we're constantly monitoring what we're getting back from those mailbox providers, what we're getting back from those recipients, what indicators um, and what they're telling us. Um, about what we're sending and whether it's it's the right thing to do. Um, if we're seeing deferrals, then we need to back off, maybe go a bit slower, maybe roll it back a bit, try again a bit slower. Um, if things are looking good, then maybe we can go a little bit quicker. And sometimes we'll get a really super fast uh, warm up on Gmail, for example, but maybe Microsoft is, is not liking the traffic quite so much and we need to do that slightly differently. Um, so there's no uh, one size fits all solution when it comes to IP warming. And I definitely wouldn't describe IP warming as necessarily an easy process to go through. So true. And do you think that um, domain warming is going to become just as important? Absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll maybe touch on this again a little bit later, but with the dawn of uh, IPv6, um, having per IP address reputations for IPv4 addresses, it's, it's not super scalable. Um, and there's an increasing reliance. I mean, Gmail is largely reliant on on the the uh, reputation of the the sending domain and the the decals domain in, in the header. So, um, domain ramp ups um, I, it's slightly easier, I think, um, but uh, they still are just as important as the as the IP warm ups. Mm, yeah, so interesting and really good point. I've got a good expectation versus reality, and that is that it's down to my email service provider whether I reach the inbox or not. And this is quite a common expectation. So if you're not reaching with your current ESP, then maybe switching to one with better deliverability will help. But actually, the frequency, the cadence, um, the content, and the targeting of your mail, and of course the cleanliness and integrity of your database are what are going to drive your inbox placement. And it's really not in the ESP's control at all. They can give you some very good advice and they can help you to deliver. But those, those things are much more important. Of course, collection practices can be crucial, making sure you've got the consent of your users to receive mail. And, and all of those things are in the sender's control, not the ESP's. Yeah, I'm sure anybody else who's working at an ESP or who runs an MTA, like we we wish there was some magical configuration we could put on the mail service to deliver everything to the inbox. But um, unfortunately, uh, it's it's not up to it's not up to us. So true. And speaking of people who who manage MTAs, um, one of the uh, expectations that I've kind of encountered um, with 
um, certain companies where they've kind of built an MTA is that, you know, once you've built it and you've put the settings in for numbers of connections and messages per connection and amount of data per connection, that, all that kind of thing, um, that, that's it, you're done. Um, and you can just leave it alone for the next uh, 13 years. Um, and everything's just going to be groovy and crazy. Um, and in reality, mailbox providers are constantly trying to stay ahead of the spammers, right? Um, and uh, using reputation of um, IPs or sending domains um, to change the volumes that they'll accept, to change the number of connections they'll accept, or the number of messages per connection they'll accept, uh, the, the rate of messages that they'll accept through a connection, um, is it, they have to constantly change this. And they don't publish these changes um, because, I mean, that would make my life very boring. Um, but also because if they did, then, then spammers can figure it out. And they have to constantly change it because you can kind of start to figure out where the limits are just purely by experimentation. That's part of what my, what my job is, is, is pushing things and just testing and seeing how quickly you can deliver them in. Um, but of course, if we can do that, so can the spammers. Um, so the goalposts are currently shift, are constantly shifting, um, and uh, new domains, new mailbox providers um, pop up on new services and things, or new features and stuff. So you constantly have to be really on top of it um, and uh, constantly kind of tinkering and tweaking things to um, improve the performance of your mail service. Thanks, Tam. Absolutely. Um, yes, no set it and forget it, sadly. You've got to keep up with those bounce codes. Um, oh, gosh, the bounce codes. <laughs> my next expectation is that there is a secret hotline to mailbox providers like Gmail, Hotmail, Verizon Media Group, as they are now, um, so that your email service provider can just ring them and say, hey, my client's not a spammer. You should deliver their mail. They're a really good sender. But in fact, it's actually really hard for the big mailbox providers to know the difference between a good sender and a bad sender because spammers use best practices too. So um, Microsoft and Gmail don't trust anyone but their very own users to let them know what is spammy or isn't. And that's why user complaints and engagement are such an important part of these hugely complicated algorithms that most large mailbox providers use to identify spam. So it's great not to look like a spammer, but it's a very close line and very hard to identify sometimes the difference. So the key thing is, is to send mail that people want to receive and are engaging with. Um, mailbox providers can see that and you're going to land in the inbox where you belong. So- Alice, what, yeah. what do you think about um, uh, using like people replying to emails as a way to kind of indicate engagement? Do you think that's an effective I'm not sure how effective it is, but I really like it. I think that for Gmail especially, setting up a conversation can only help your reputation. But working for a large brand who struggles to reply to all the responses that we have coming into us, I know that it's not always possible. I don't think it's going to massively affect your deliverability. However, um, email is a communications channel, and I think it's more two-way conversation. The more you can listen to your users, the, the better. So, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. I just really realized how hard it is to actually implement. Great points. Thank you. It is time for another poll. Um, this one is around whether you folks are using dedicated IPs, whether you're using shared IPs or whether you're using a mix of both. Please vote now and let us know how your setup works. Voting, voting. Mm. Not seeing a lot of love from a shared IPs out there. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay, so there's like quite a few people using a mixture. Um, it's not a lot of using solely shared IPs. Fair amount using dedicated. I guess if you're managing your own MTAs uh, in house, more likely to have your own IPs for that. But yeah, cool, cool. Well, that feeds into my next slide, which uh, might be slightly controversial, um, which is that uh, I don't think dedicated IPs are necessarily the best solution for every brand. 
um, I know we talk a lot about um, building your reputation, your reputation being really super important for delivery, inbox placement or deliverability. Um, but I don't think that everybody or brands are going to benefit from uh, dedicated IPs. In fact, uh, a lot of brands are going to do actually the same or even better on, on dedicated IPs than they are going to do on well-managed um, shared IPs. And there's a few reasons for that. So first of all, you've got the, the cost and the process of warming dedicated IPs and the ongoing cost of dedicated IPs is, is always a, a factor, um, especially for, for smaller brands. Um, but then once you go through the ramp up process, so the ramp up process that we discussed, we're sending to all of our really super engaged um, recipients, um, gradually increasing over time, lots of good indicators, there's mailbox providers, um, but at some point you're going to get to the point where you're like, right, okay, we're at good volume and we're going to go to our um, business as usual sending. And if at that point you're um, not sending really consistently, sort of daily, near daily, um, a decent volume of mail to mailbox providers, um, you're not going to have the consistency um, and the volume to maintain the reputation of dedicated IPs um, at the mailbox provider. And we see this particularly with um, with the Microsoft, uh, hotmail.com, outlook.com, hotmail.co.uk, live.com, all of those kind of domains. We, we frequency issues with um, dedicated IP performance um, when we see brands using dedicated IPs to send really super inconsistently. So doing like one big send a week, for example, um, whereas the better performance is if you are able to send like to how many subscribers like daily or near daily um, to, to maintain, build and maintain their reputation. There's also the issue, as I mentioned um, earlier, as I chatted about it, which was um, IPv6 versus IPv4. So IPv6, there are many billions, trillions, quadrillions um, more IP addresses than with uh, IPv4, um, at which point it becomes non-scalable really to start assigning um, a reputation necessarily per IP address. Um, and a lot of mailbox providers, Gmail um, is the one that kind of was one of the earlier adopters have moved to using um, the sending domain instead. Um, and a lot of them are mo moving to using sending domain based reputation. Um, so you can on good well-managed uh, IPs, if you're using um, your own sending domain, and especially if you're using custom DKIM, that's, that's quite important as well. Um, to build your own reputation, even if you're on shared IPs, those shared IPs are well managed. Um, especially if you're not a regular sender, you're not a consistent sender, you don't have these like really good volumes um, daily or near daily, you can do better on um, shared IPs. You have to be a little bit careful about which ESP you choose. Um, you want one with a really good vetting process um, and who proactively manages their shared IPs um, and supports custom DKIM. Obviously, the better the vetting process, the more kind of hoops and questions they're making um, you answer. Um, that means they're doing the same with all the other clients that they're onboarding, um, which is better for the ecosystem um, that they're operating in. Um, dedicated IPs, if you're sending good, consistent volumes, they can be great. And obviously, it does completely at the moment separate your reputation out. But again, there's no one size fits all for this. And um, shared IPs may be better for your brand um, than using dedicated IPs. You have to choose what's going to be best for your business. Yeah, I agree, Tam. And I think having worked at various email service providers, most of them are very protect protective over their shared pools to make sure they're the best quality they can possibly be, because they've got lots of different clients using those pools. So they have to be really tip top reputation. Oh, absolutely. Like when you're in a dedicated IP, you're you're entirely in charge of your own destiny, um, whether you behave well or you don't behave so well. Um, but when you're on shared IPs, um, you know, we're, we're there is as your guardians and protectors, keeping an eye out for you, um, constantly monitoring to make sure that, that nothing's nothing's going right. Yay. Thanks, Tom. The next deliverability slide that we have is around email being really a victim of its own success. It works really well. I mean, that's why we love it. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to explain why just sending more and more mail doesn't lead to more and more revenue. And this is an ongoing conversation I've had over all of the roles that I've had, and it's a fight I'm still fighting at change.org. Um, actually, in reality, 
over-mailing unengaged users is a key driver for deliverability issues, as we'll see in an example of where things go wrong later. But sometimes it's very hard to have that argument as, as to why you shouldn't just send more. I'm a big fan of sending lots of mail, but just the right, the right type and to the right person. Right email, right time, right person, right? That's the one. <laughs> Um, and so, Alice, you touched on this earlier about changing ESPs um, to improve your deliverability. And I saw a great quote from somebody in the industry recently who said, like, um, what was it? It was like, uh, changing your ESP to improve your deliverability is like changing gym, it, it changing your gym because you're not getting the results that you want um, from your gym. And um, it's, it's similar with changing your IP address or your sending domain to fix um delivery or even inbox placement issues um so if you're seeing a lot of deferrals um or a lot of fails due to blocks and things like that so that will just switch it out new ip new setting domain um and it'll be fixed and that'll work for a bit it'll definitely work during the ramp up process um because obviously as i said before going back to this like ramp up process sending super engaged people lots of positive indicators and stuff you'll see like you know, the, those blocks aren't appearing and there's no deferrals and everything's delivering great and things are landing in the inbox. But at some point, you're going to go back to your business as usual sending. And if you haven't fixed those underlying challenges that you were having with your data collection and hygiene or what you're sending, just not matching recipients' expectations, um, even if that re recipient expectation is that they wouldn't be receiving an email from you, um, if you're not fixing those underlying problems, uh, very soon um, afterwards, either during ramp up or shortly after, you're going to find yourself in the same pickle again. And then you've just forked out for a new IP or a new sending domain and a whole ramp up and everything. Um, so it's really important uh, to look at what you're doing um, that are going that is triggering these issues and actually address the underlying causes um, rather than just um, swapping out um, the IP or the sending domain. I mean, I think the good news is that there's, I, I haven't really come across an IP that couldn't be fixed. So, you know, there's, there's always, there's always hope. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Ooh, another poll and an interesting one this time. This is about, I love experiments personally. Experimenting is my favorite thing. I think something that people do wrong with experiments is often they change more than one variable at a time. And then it's like, as a scientist, I'm like, how do you decide which variable had the right outcome? But so anyway, that aside, um, how much testing do you do? Do you test subject lines, content? Um, do you do sending uh, send time uh, testing? Just absolutely everything, hopefully one at a time because scientific method. Um, are you kind of like in a place where you actually like to be doing a little bit more testing? Let's have a poll and um, see if everybody's disappeared already, but um, I'll see what people are doing. Oh, we've got some brave folks who are hang hanging in there. Oh, I'm loving to see we test everything. I wish we tested everything. Oh man, I could spend, I mean, I spend a decent amount of my time designing various tests and experiments. I could definitely stand to spend like 100% of my time doing it. So fun. Awesome. I, think I like that poll a lot. I do too. <laughs> I think that brings us on to our next deliverability expectation. And that is, um, our mail is absolutely amazing. We all say so. Uh, we think it's fantastic. Our marketing team's the best. Our design team is the greatest. It's very easy to see mail with a brand focus and not really a user mindset. And what's good for the company might not actually be good for your audience. So testing to make sure that you're reaching your users with the right content, right person, right content, right time, as you said, Tam, is absolutely essential. And it's essential to make sure that you're sending the content they most respond to at the time that works for them. You can test the cadence, you can test the content, the subject line, I mean, this is the joy of email. Um, and of course, engagement means conversions, which is great for us. And it also means inbox placement. So it's really a double whammy. I think we're having another technical glitch, Alice. 
We've, I'm, I'm currently seeing the poll still on my screen. Oh, well, we just, we just don't like technology today. No, either that or technology doesn't like us. I wouldn't blame it. I, I spend a lot of time poking. We need technology to go. We've got a graph coming up next. Can you see that one now? Uh, I cannot see that graph. It's a lovely. Um, which is a, it's a very fun graph. Okay, let's go back into tech and see what's going on here. <laughs> we should do another poll of like who can see the graph right now. <laughs> it was stop sharing of the screen, and then we're going to start sharing again. <laughs> Oh, I see you. Oh, you see me. Oh, well, that's nice. I'm oh. going to, I've been made the presenter, and you can now see my face, which is a treat, I'm sure. <laughs> and can oh, it's green. Oh, oh my yes. God. Just, this is a rock and roll. Sorry, it's a roller coaster ride today, which it's got. <laughs> sounds. Why don't you just oh. pile straight into this graph, Tam? Oh, this is this is my favorite bit. I love seeing graphs. I especially love seeing graphs um, of where things are wrong, wrong for people. This is a time when things went very wrong in my life. Um, so here we see uh, a graph of um, seven IPs, um, and we we've got a rogue IP in here. So what we're looking at here is um, the number of um, Microsoft deferral messages. So these are the try again later kind of messages um for each of these seven ips and we can see this pink ip i can see here um was just not having a very good time of it um the interesting thing about this was that um all of these ips were in a pool pooled together um so they're all sending exactly the same traffic split evenly between them um and uh yet one of them uh microsoft decided was its mortal enemy um, and, and we see all, all of these deferrals um, just for that one uh, single uh, IP. We could not determine um, the cause of this. There was nothing particularly nefarious that we could see went on. We think it might have had something to do with SRD. So this is Microsoft's um, secret cabal of volunteer users um, who get sent mail and um, then get to vote on whether or not they would consider a piece of mail spam. And, Sometimes if you get one too many of those and you're not quite sending enough mail to override it, um, it proportionally, um, you can see this kind of uh, problems with IPs. Anyway, um, it was still fixable, even though we had this happen. I pulled it out of the pool, um, stopped sending through it for a couple of weeks, uh, and then just re wrapped it um, over a few more weeks. And it was fine in the end, but this is the kind of thing that, um, that, that I wake up uh, sweating at like 3 a.m. <laughs> just just like this kind of thing happening with IPs. Um, so yeah, so that's my that's my first graph. I have more graphs. I, I enjoy the graph. <laughs> um, so this next graph is um, this is a ramp up. Um, I don't know how many of you have done ramp ups before um, showing volumes. Um, this is not what a ramp up should look like. Um, and this represents a, a bit of a breakdown um, in the uh, relationship between us as an ESP and um, the client who's sending it at the time. Communications breakdown, a uh, bit of a misunderstanding. Client did, did not seem to grasp the core concept of a ramp up, which is that nice, steady, gradual increase. Um, they started doing it. You can see right at the beginning, they kind of started but like, for a few days, for a few cents with, with a little ramp up. And then they were just like, okay, we're done with this. We're bored with this now. We're just going to do whatever. Um, and what we see is the green represents um, so successfully relayed uh, mail. The pink red line um, represents deferral errors. And then we see some blue spikes in there, which are messages that fail delivery altogether. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this was ongoing over a while. Um, discussions were happening. Um, expectations were not managed uh, along the lines of how long a ramp up was going to take for a dedicated IP. Um, or the type of content that they need to send, the level of engagement, the amount of monitoring. Um, this is, you know, this is our bad as well as the client's bad in this in this particular instance. This is a while ago. Processes have been refined, I should say that. But um, but yeah, but this is a bit of breakdown. And what we saw was just their messages were taking a long time to be delivered. So that red line, um, the axis for that graph is actually on um, the right hand side. So it was many tens of thousands more 
um, delayed messages than it was relayed or failed messages. So their, their emails were taking hours and hours to be delivered. Um, they were seeing high failure rates of just messages timing out, just being blocked. Um, and, and this took a long time to resolve. We convinced them to kind of reduce their sending for a while. Things improved and then they just went at it again. <laughs> um, so uh, we did manage to eventually get these guys back on track, um, but it, it took um, significantly longer than it needed to take. Ouch. Yeah, and, and this is what it should have looked like. Um, this is what I wanted for them. This is what I want for all my clients um, is this nice kind of ramp up. So here um, again, we see relayed in green looking nice, nice, steady, gentle increase um, going up. Um, the pink line is delayed. Again, that access to that is on the right hand side, but it's actually like a factor of 10 smaller than what's on the left. So this was just a handful of deferrals that they were they were getting back. Um, and, you know, once they were sending all these nice positive signals to the mailbox provider by sending their nice engaged content and doing it, increasing their volume gradually and everything, those deferrals were just like, the, the mailbox provider was just like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, you can, you can send faster, you can, you can go quicker, you can send us more because what you're sending is actually, is actually wanted mail and you're, you're building up a really good reputation. Um, and then my final graph is pretty cool. So I touched on this earlier, I said I'd circle back to it. Um, so this is what happens to delivery time. So the length of time it takes to get a, a 250 OK from a recipient mail server on average. Um, if you send to the most engaged recipients first. So we always recommend this to clients. Um, I think a lot of deliverability uh, professionals and consultants do, which is send when you when you're doing a big send, if you send to your most engaged recipients, opens and clickers first. Um, what this does is it kind of like primes mailbox providers um, because the initial flow of mail coming in, they're seeing like a lot of good engagement and they're like, okay, this is wanted mail. So after that, like more of the mail tends to um, land in your inbox instead of in, in junk. Um, but what we also see is they're then um, more open to us sending a bit faster afterwards. So we made a change um, quite a while back now. Uh, where we um, did this automatically for our clients. So we automatically, during our sends, sent it to the most engaged first. Um, and we saw a dramatic reduction in our delivery times. Um, for some of the clients, our clients, especially those who were maybe on a bit of a gray area when it came to like best practices and stuff, um, we saw around a 70% decrease in delivery times to some of the major mailbox providers when we introduced this change. So this is a this is a good one. This is a nice, nice experiment. It was it was really good. So deliverability, when things go wrong, this view here is where we're actually looking at Google Postmaster tools and showing the domain reputation for a sender. And we can see that it was sort of happily tipping along at medium and even touching on high. And then suddenly things went wrong and there was a significant drop in, in reputation. Um, and if you're seeing a significant drop like this for your for your domain reputation, then you're probably seeing a significant proportion of your mail going to the, to the spam folder. And you'll probably be able to see that either through a monitoring tool or reflected in your open and click rates. So um, the Gmail Postmaster tools, or Google Postmaster tools, I should call them, are free to use, and they can give you really good insight into how you're being regarded as a sender. Let's have a look at how that was turned around. So this sender, we, there was an investigation. It seemed that the sender had started using a new data source containing some rather out of date addresses, um, possibly not opted in. Um, and once this toxic data source was removed, um, the user sent to their more engaged users for a while, mended their reputation at, at Gmail, and you can see their reputation went barreling back up to high. Um, the Gmail started to trust their mail again. Um, I've never worked with a sender whose reputation couldn't be fixed. Um, and really for, for Gmail, especially sending to your most engaged is great, but for most of your, um, for, for the, most of the mailbox providers, as time was just touching on, if you send mail people want, then you're much more likely to get delivered and reach the inbox. Here's yeah, I think sometimes, Go on, sometimes you, can give the, uh, you can give the mailbox providers a little break, like stop sending for a little while, let the reputations reset and stuff, and then, and then start sending again, like ramp up, most engaged, so, yeah. Yes, do, do better next time. Um, here's an example of those open rates that we were talking about. You can see here open rates at different providers. Now, of course, 
open rates are, um, are measured by, in a different ways by different mailbox providers. So they're not always going to be the same, but usually we see the same, roughly the same, peaks and troughs in the in the open. So you can see the bottom line here is is a Microsoft um, and it's red and it's dipping where the others are spiking. And to me, this would indicate that we probably those users, uh, those recipients aren't seeing that mail to open it, probably because it's landing in the spam folder. So it would definitely be worth drilling down on that. Now, open rates are maybe not always the best success metric, but they can be a really good indicator of what's, of what's going on. And especially if, if used in this way, comparing mailbox provider to mailbox provider, which brings me on to my next poll. Um, and that is, what is the most important success metric to you? What's the key metric that you measure your email success by? Please vote now. Oh, we've got a lot of people who love their open rate. Mm. There's a lot of discussion in the industry at the moment about whether open rate is a is a good success metric. I, we still we still use it as a good indicator at, at change, but we're we we also of course conversions are really important to us with being a, a petition platform. The signatures on the petitions are, are are one of our key metrics. I always think it's just important to measure yourself against yourself. Like how was I performing last week, last month, this time last year? Um, with, with the mailbox providers when it comes to things like opens and clicks. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Making sure that you're, you're you're constantly doing better and you know, you've got to take into account seasonality and all of those things. So we often look at the previous year and this year and yeah, know, know what to expect. Moving on. So final section, we're gonna talk about the symbiosis um, between brands ESPs, MTAs, how we all work together um, to benefit each other and all of us um, and make sure our businesses are successful. Um, so when it comes right down to it, what is an ESP um, responsible for? Um, and the ESP is responsible for your sending infrastructure. So uh, whether that's uh, instances, so whether you've got um, tin servers sitting in a data somewhere, whether you've got virtual instances in a cloud, um, they're responsible for monitoring and um, tinkering with settings to keep up to date um, with latest mailbox provider requirements, number of connections, settings, throughput, all that good stuff. Even if you're just an MTA engineer, mail server engineer, working your in-house stuff, you need to be keeping an eye on that to make sure everything's optimized. Um, they can be responsible depending on um, the ESP you're using, may be responsible for some level of authentication. So they may, for example, manage um, all your uh, SPF and stuff records for you through your sending domain. But at the very least, they need to be signing messages with DKIM um, and they need to be making sure that forward and reverse DNS is set up for the sending IP addresses as well. Need to be making sure that um, similar senders are grouped together in, in pool environments if you're using shared IPs um, and monitoring those um, pooled IPs, um, making sure any bad actors are removed um, or prevented even better from getting on those IPs and then making sure that any issues with best practices are addressed. Um, and they need to be um, managing bounces. So appropriately handling um, retry intervals for uh, during SM for bounces during the SMTP transaction um, and timeouts and back off modes and things like that, but also making sure they're keeping up to date with all the latest and greatest and weirdest and wonderful um, bounce errors that mailbox providers come up with to make sure that you're um, reacting in a responsible way to that. Um, sometimes a soft bounce is, an, is a hard bounce, even though it's got a four error code, and sometimes a five error code does still mean um, that it should be a soft bounce and should be retried. Um, so that's all the things that, that, that an ESP or an MTA is responsible for. I think that I completely agree. And I also think that the ESP is or MTA is really responsible for understanding what success means to their to their client. So what's, what the client is aiming to do and how they can best help them get there. Um, Absolutely. Tailored advice is so important. Like I said earlier with like the dedicated versus shared IPs, like there's never a one size fits all. 
um, for every single brand. And it's really important that, that an ESP understands or an MTA understands their clients, um, what they're trying to achieve, what success looks like for them, um, and how they can best advise to, to help them achieve that. Mm. Yeah, totally. I mean, and on the same degree as, a, as what the sender is responsible for is communicating with the ESP, no nasty surprises, letting them know what they're planning to do, why they're planning to do it, what success looks like for them, helping them help them be successful. And of course, other than that, all the things that we spoke about earlier, being completely in control of the sender, um, what you're sending, who you're sending to, um, etc. But beyond that making sure that your mail is really consistent and it's well branded that's not just good for brand affinity but it builds user trust and it also helps to establish your sender reputation with your mailbox provider so making sure that that you're 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 mailing in a consistent way and that your mails are clearly look like they're coming from you and they don't suddenly change branding halfway through uh, can really help establish that trust yeah, I mean, given how uh, recipients are being trained now to look for all these weird like changes and things as a sign of potential phishing or scamming, you know, that's Can't absolutely be. great. Yeah. yeah. So how can we work together? Um, communication and cooperation are the key things here. Um, communication. So making sure that we are, as an ESP or an MTA, we're listening to our customers, listening to our clients, understanding what they're trying to do, how they operate, what their business model is, what their sales cycle looks like, um, understanding what their pain points are and what their challenges are, um, and understanding what it is that ultimately they view as being successful. Um, and in return, um, brands need to really communicate back to their ESPs and MTAs. As I said, like, tell us, if you're going to do something different, tell us if you're changing things, tell us when you're having problems, tell us, like talk to us, like let us help you work through things. Um, and then we may well offer some advice and we're not just offering the advice just for like fun and giggles and to make you do things that you don't want to do. Like the advice we offer is based on years of experience and expertise um, in improving deliverability and delivery issues, especially when we make, ask you to make short term changes like short term reduced volumes um, to help with certain issues. Like I know it's hard. We understand it's hard. Explain to us how it's hard. Explain to us what you can do and what you can't do. We'll work with you on that. But understand that sometimes we need to do those little things to improve things overall. Like. As an ESP, I want my clients to be successful because that means um, we're successful. It means that our ESP is successful if our clients are successful. So we're we're doing our best to like try and try and help uh, you out as well as much as we can. But I think we could do more. Like certainly, we could do more to listen to our clients to really pay attention to what they're saying. I think it's certainly very hard having moved from the ESP world into a to working directly for a brand. I do feel like apologising to, to a lot of my old clients. Apologies if there's any old clients about just saying, just go and get this for me or just go and do this without realizing sometimes there's a real business decision struggle on the brand side to get what seems like the easiest thing in the world when you're looking at it from the ESP side. But, um, but as you say, Tom, good communication there really, really helps. Yeah, yeah. I think also like um, I know we spoke before about um, brand selecting their ESP and how brands select their ESP and um, making sure that the ESP that you select, like go through a good RFP process, make sure the ESP that you choose has the features and support that you need. Some brands are more happy managing themselves and they just need a very light touch. Um, some brands need more support and more involvement. So um, making sure when you go through that, that process, selecting an ESP, you pick somebody that's, that's going to be right for you as well. Um, I think it's really key. Completely. It's not always going to be the person with the most, most bells and whistles. It really depends what you need to achieve. Um, and it's very easy to get blinded by all the amazing stuff that you might be able to do. But what do you actually need to do? There's plenty of time to move on to that stuff later. It might be a little bit outfacing. Or you may just end up with a lot of tech that is, you're paying for that is not actually useful to you and is not getting you to where you need to go. So, yes, having that really good conversation with the, with the email service providers about what you need and what they can they can give you. I think that's all from us today. We made it through with no more technical glitches. But we do, of course, have time for questions, which is great. And please follow both Tam and I if you'd like to keep the conversation going. We're both on Twitter or um, you know, please ask your ask your questions now. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. So um, first question is from uh, Lauren uh, Kickbox, who's asking, what's in my cup? Um, it's tea, because <laughs> British and afternoon. <laughs> um, so yes. Um, so then we've got... Um, Marcel, you are so true. The poll was definitely missing. You are a, a, an ESP or nice. Apologies. Yeah. I, yes. I didn't think we'd be blessed with the uh, attendance of any actual ISPs or mailbox providers to be fair. So, uh, no, yes. you need to give us feedback afterwards, you know, will we telling the truth? <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a couple of uh, comments on specific slides, um, but I can't actually see where we were in the presentation when we were actually um, looking at that slides. Um, so I'll just I'll skip over those, um, a technical problem. Um, uh, one from Olaf saying, could you please describe again what the advantage of shared IPs are? Alice, do you have any comments about shared IPs versus I shared do. IPs? I do, have, I do have a comment. If you're a small sender and you haven't got a great deal of volume or, or you're sending irregularly, Sending over shared IPs is really great for you because you are sharing the good reputation of other senders of, of, a, of a similar type. And most email service providers will make sure they have different pools of shared IPs that are appropriate for different parts of their client base. So, um, so you're, you're picking up on the good reputation of other senders, which helps ease your traffic through when it might look from if it was sent on its own through um, its own dedicated IP, it might be a bit bitty or, um, as I said, consistency is really great. So if you're sending in sudden spikes and then not sending for a month and then sending another spike, then mailbox providers might be um, wary of your traffic. Whereas if it's sending over shared IPs, it's with a lot of other traffic. So it's, um, it's, it's, less, of a, it's, it's less of a worry to them. It's not, it's not out of the ordinary. Yeah, sense? I mean, if I look, at, I look at the traffic through my shared IPs, and it kind of goes sort of like, it's like quite nice and like, you know, there's a there's a wave there. It's the curve, but it's a consistent high volume. Um, when we find issues with dedicated IP senders, it's spiky. Little, I don't have the graph demonstrated, but it's super spiky with long periods of like no sending and stuff. And um, and yeah, that's definitely where you run into issues. You're on well managed IPs. Um, then yeah, you benefit from that evening out. The best example I've got is like our transactional IPs. We send most of our transactional goes through shared IPs because transactional, um, so order confirmations, things like that, you don't know how much you're gonna be sending. You can't predict that kind of, what kind of volume you're gonna be sending. Um, so the advantage of shared transactional IPs especially is it's all transactional traffic. So it's all really good traffic, great reputation on the IPs. Um, but you've got like consistent volumes going through those IPs, um, so you don't seem to see, you don't seem to get the same issues. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. We've got a new question from Janine, and she says, I'm just glad you could join Janine, that's all good. You missed the car crash at the beginning, so that's great. Um, what <laughs> about Bimmy? Does it help to improve deliverability? And my feeling, if I jump in, is that it doesn't necessarily improve deliverability, but it improves your identity as a sender, and it's easier to identify you, and that can only be a, a good thing. Um, and every little helps. Um, so I don't necessarily think that it's going to it's going to improve your deliverability per se, but I think it's definitely a good thing to implement. Tam, what do you think? So I think that um, Bimmy can have an indirect effect on your deliverability um, in that to implement Bimmy, you need to have DMARC set to an enforcement, so quarantine or reject, which means that you need to go through the process of looking at DMARC throughout your, your infrastructure, um, especially if you're not sending email from a subdomain. Um, if you've got email saying going out from a parent domain, for example, um, you've got email going out from a lot of different places using the same domain and stuff. Um, you need to go through the process of moving to DMARC enforcement, which can be a bit long and a bit complex, but does require you to make sure all of your mail is authenticated using SPF or DKIM, which can have uh, an effect on, on delivery and deliverability, um, improving that. Um, so there's that. But also another requirement of um, Vimy is that you have a good reputation at the um, mailbox provider that you're sending to. Um, so you've got to do some work, maybe. I, I don't know. 
taking you a great Sunday, you don't have to do any work, but you might have to do some work to improve your reputation at a mailbox provider. So you might have to do a bit more targeting if you're engaged and rejig how you um, retire subscribers um, or re-engage subscribers, rejig your content and stuff, all those kind of things. Um, and I think that could have an indirect effect on improving your inbox placement because you've had to, to improve your reputation to be able to get your Billy logo to appear. Um, so that's, I'm not sure necessarily that it has any direct effect on inbox placement. Maybe there's some, it improves trust a little bit, your subscribers or your recipients um, because your logo is showing. Um, but I think indirectly, definitely is good. As long as you're authenticating, I mean, that's the, that's, that's the main thing. Authentication, definitely a great start. Obviously, it's not like airtight because sellers can authenticate as well. But like I always tell, take a belt and braces approach. Like if there is something that I can do to make things a little bit more secure and stuff, I'm, I might as well do them, right? <laughs> but make sure you do it well, especially with DMARC. Like 